Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Mrs. Michelle Garcia from the Department of Command and Leadership, and I want to welcome you to day two of our Profession of Arms Forum. We will begin with the Just War Strategy and Ethical Considerations Panel. As a reminder, please ensure your cell phones are turned off or silent. The first question of this panel will be recorded. After that, it will be a not for attribution conversation with your questions and the panel members. Today we have with us four distinguished individuals representing our military and academic communities. From your left to right, first we have Lieutenant General Charles Petey. Lieutenant General Petey graduated from the University of Virginia and received his commission through ROTC. He attended the University of Virginia Law School and holds degrees in military law and national security and strategic studies. His operational experience includes Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and Operation Iraqi Freedom in Iraq. Dr. Martin Cook retired from the U.S. Naval War College in 2017 as the Admiral Stockdale Professor of Professional Military Ethics. He now holds that title as an emeritus professor. Prior to serving at the Naval War College, Dr. Cook served at the U.S. Air Force Academy and the U.S. Army War College and numerous civilian colleges and universities. He was co-editor of the Journal of Military Ethics for seven years and was selected for the Fulbright Program Specialist roster 2018 to 2021. Dr. Cook received his PhD from the University of Chicago and he now resides in Colorado Springs and continues to lecture and consult internationally. Dr. Brian Orend received his PhD from Columbia University in New York and is currently the Professor of Philosophy at the University of Waterloo in Canada. He is the author of eight books, including The Morality of War, and is best known for his work on post-war justice and human rights. He has been a guest lecturer at each of the major U.S. military academies and was the Distinguished Visiting Professor of Human Rights at Lund University in Sweden. Dr. Pauline shanks Corinne holds a PhD in philosophy from Temple University and is a specialist in military ethics, just war theory, philosophy of law, and applied ethics. She is a published author and professor of military ethics at the U.S. Naval War College, College of Leadership and Ethics in Newport, Rhode Island. Her recent publications include When Less is Not More, Expanding the Combatant-Non-Combatant -combatant Distinction, and Achilles Goes Asymmetrical, The Warrior, Military Ethics, and Contemporary Warfare. Dr. shanks Corinne, gentlemen, before I go to the students for their questions, I would like each of you to take a few moments to state your thoughts on our ability to conduct a just war across the domains of land, sea, air, cyber, and space. At this time, we will stop recording. I'm sorry. Lieutenant General Petey, will you please start? Stop recording now. <laughs> Not yet. How do you hear me? You're good? Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Chuck Petey. Thank you uh, very much uh, for the introduction, and thanks to the student, uh, staff and faculty, uh, particularly General Lundy, General Moranian, for the invitation. Uh, I feel privileged to be here, very humbled to be here with this, this panel of experts, and I, I would offer just a couple of ob observations, uh, perhaps to get some of the conversation going. Uh, the ability to, wear, to wage just war obviously is predicated on the notion, at least in modern times, that war is, uh, is generally been outlawed as a matter of state, uh, only authorized in matters of self-defense, authorized by the UN. We know that. Uh, there's an excellent, excellent piece, Chapter 3, of your readings from uh, Mr. Cook, Professor Cook, Dr. Cook, that lays that out very clearly, I think. Um, what I would offer to this group is uh, sort of on the, on, the, on the spectrum of the 17 capability gaps that General Lundy talks about. And I would add an 18th. Uh, and I would ask you to think about uh, our ability to wage war in the future, should it be authorized as a matter of state, uh, that is uh, either in self-defense or as a matter of uh, UN resolution, assuming that occurs, the ability to wage war lawfully is affected by two things right now in my mind. 
Uh, one, it's the internal wiring that we've adopted, adapted to for the last 18, 19 years of COIN. You've heard this referred to in many different ways, but it, it hobbles, in my mind, our warfighting forces. It's the notion that we're fighting the last war and the next war. That is a highly constrained, policy-driven, entirely legitimate, but policy-driven constraint on the laws of armed conflict for the purpose of fighting a counterterrorism type of war. It results in the use of precision weapons. It results in the use of uh, highly stratified decision making. And it therefore produces a wired leader, including, including and that includes all branches that, that, uh, uh, that are involved in this, um, it, it causes us to think in a peer-to-peer -peer fight um, it causes us to go through our wiring diagram for a coin fight, and that causes hesitation, and that is lethal to our forces. So that's, to me, that's part of the 18th gap. Uh, the other part is our legal maneuver space, which is constantly being encroached upon internationally. This is the external. There's an internal and there's an external threat to our ability to engage in just war. The external threat is there are countless groups, including the ICRC, academics, NGOs, who would suggest that because we have precision weapons, we must use them. Because we have loitering surveillance devices, we must use them. Uh, because uh, we can, uh, well, for example, that we must minimize certain types of collateral damage to include things, as, uh, things like mental distress um, in a civilian population. Um, what we have to remember is that the LOAC allows for a great deal more than what we've experienced in a coin setting. And we, that external threat constantly encroaches. And what we, we have to, in order for us to engage in ethical war fighting and just war fighting, we have to constantly remind ourselves that the LOAC circle of authorized use of force is much larger than the ROE circle of use of force. ROE is a subset of LOAC, and so um, my, my greatest concern as the Judge Advocate General of the Army is our ability in the next fight, assuming it's a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer fight, is our ability to wage a, 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 a measured, ethical, appropriate uh, war fighting in the larger setting of LOAC. That requires training, experience, um, and that requires rewiring from a coin-centric environment. I'll pause there. Okay, I want to raise, rather than answer a question, I want to raise some concerns that I've been thinking about it lately. Um, these are difficult and profound questions, and I really do have more questions than answers. Why is that? I believe that the world right now is going through a period of profound change in its understanding of the international order um, in ways that may well undermine what has been for centuries a common understanding of the rules of state conduct and war fighting. And because I believe that's true, it's hard to see well, we, when and where a new consensus will emerge. The international system has no natural shape. When there is order, it is created and sustained by the efforts of human beings. And periodically, there are profound, there are profound shakeups to previously agreed order, and I think we're in one right now. So let's think for a minute of how the order we've grown up with uh, emerged. That system was created in Europe at the end of the horrible wars of religion that followed the, followed the Protestant Reformation. It was created at a specific place at a specific time, namely the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. It was created as an, in an attempt to solve the problem of perpetual war in Europe as the major Christian uh, powers of Europe each strove to restore a unified Christendom but couldn't agree on what form of Christianity would uh, be shared across Europe. It's important to remind ourselves that the Westphalian order was not the triumph of anybody's ideals and it was considered suboptimal by all the players. It broke up Europe into a new political entity, the sovereign state. It gave those states two fundamental rights, territorial integrity and political sovereignty. If states respected each other's territorial integrity, then states would refrain from invading each other. And if they respected the political sovereignty, 
of each other. It meant states were free to manage their internal affairs as they saw fit, notably including the right to persecute religious minorities without interference by other states, which was one of the major issues in, pl in play. So it's important to ask yourself, why does Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion have a letter to the King of France at the front of it? Because Calvin's trying to persuade the French king not to persecute Protestants, uh, that Protestants are acceptable. Eventually, European expansion and colonialism stamped this Westphalian model of a sovereign state with territorial integrity and political sovereignty across the globe. But it's important to remember that it is very much a European Christian solution to a very European problem. Of course, now that Europe was religiously balkanized, the old Christian just war tradition would have to be rebuilt on secular foundations, most notably in Hugo Grotius' efforts to, rest um, to restore Hugo Grotius, who argued that um, it could be grounded in natural law a share and shared human reason, and it would be valid, as he said, et, et si Deus non doretur, even God does not exist, even if God does not exist. Eventually, this all evolved into the legal structures of the Hague and Geneva Conventions, into international institutions such as the League of Nations, the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Court of Justice. But despite this appearance of universality, the fact remains that the whole system rests on European and largely Christian foundations. It is now rapidly becoming apparent that other cultural traditions are pushing back to radically undermine this system. China's rapidly rising power um, and its response to what it refers to as the 19th century, uh, century of bad treaties, um, uh, it, the Chinese claim is we only agreed to these treaties and to this international structure because we were weak. And now that we're back with real power, its activities in the South China Sea, which are in direct violation of the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention, to which, by the way, China is signatory, um, uh, and it, it, which has been ruled illegal by the International Court of Arbitration um, uh, in the lawsuit from the Philippines. But PLA writers have published uh, articles advocating what they call unrestricted warfare, an explicit violation of the fundamental tenets of just war, such as proportionality and discrimination. One of the best books on Chinese thinking about all this is called Never Forget National Humiliation. And in that book, Chinese American scholar argues that uh, now that, uh, that China has, uh, the People's Republic has had to replace communism as an ideology, which doesn't really work after Tiananmen, with a more strident uh, nationalism that has become Chinese master narrative. They're coming back to what they consider their rightful place in the world as the hegemon of all Asia and the Middle Kingdom, to which other states in the region at least should defer and pay tribute. Russia's invasion and claims of annexation to Crimea and the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine clearly breaks an understanding that European powers would not acquire each other's territory by aggression. If you told anybody 10 years ago that European territory be, would be acquired by aggression in our time, I don't think anybody would have believed you. Since Crimea has no land connection to Russia, they've now built a bridge to it. Vladimir Putin has described the fall of the Soviet Union as, quote, the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century and sees his role as restoring Russia to its rightful place as a major power in world affairs. Iran's activities across the Middle East only rarely overtly rise to interstate warfare, but are framed largely in terms of Shia versus Sunni Islamic uh, conflict. And of course, the US government shows active distaste for international systems such as the UN, NATO, and so forth. Books with titles like The Jungle Grows Back and The Rise and Fall of World Peace have started to appear regularly on the bestseller lists. University of Chicago scholar Mearsheimer published recently a book called The Great Delusion in which he argues that the whole appearance of a liberal international order and international law was itself illusory in the first place. So my question is how out of this cacophony do we find something approaching an international consensus on the rules of state conduct in war. In a sense, Westphalia was easier because it was an inter-European agreement. The conversation the world needs to have now is radically more cross-cultural. As I said at the outset, I have more questions about all this than answers, but I suggest some serious thinking about, uh, to do about all these questions. And 
need for political leadership, which is sorely lacking globally, to address them. So it seems to me we are in uh, almost in a state of absence of, a, of an agreed upon international system. Thanks. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I was going to say, since I'm from Canada, I always appreciate the opportunity to come someplace to thaw out, but... Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, just a delight and an honor uh, to be here. Um, I really appreciate the comments of uh, my two former uh, the people preceding me because um, they carved out a compelling case for the challenges for our ability to conduct just war. Right? The way I like to see just war, though, is it's a middle ground tradition between two extremist perspectives. The one extreme is the pacifist extreme. War is outlawed. And obviously, a great many civilian hopes are attached to that extreme. The other extreme, which Martin describes so well, is the extreme of no holds barred, just pure, realist, strategic, national selfishness. And these, like the idealistic pull of pacifism and then the kind of uh, cynical, interest-based pull of realism seems to not leave a stable middle ground, right? Which would be the just war tradition, right? Sometimes wars might be permissibly fought, but if you're in the middle ground, not only does it seem unstable, you have a harder and more complicated time of making your case, right? If you say, well, sometimes armed force might be justified, you have to explain when that might be. If you explain, uh, well, sometimes there's a good way to deploy force, you have to explain in detail how that might be. And it, it's frustrating and complicated. Uh, my own core field of work within Just War is uh, the postbellum, right? So post-war reconstruction, right? Uh, obviously, another field where there's been a lot of challenges uh, uh, showing the difficulty of implementing principles of justice and ethics, right? How do we end a war properly, right, so that there isn't uh, the next one, so to speak. So what I would like to say is just to kind of add to uh, the excellent prior contributions to this panel is that even though the challenges to just war theory and our ability to conduct just war, as per the question, are real and potent. It's important to keep in mind the need for that middle ground, <laughs> the big, sensible, messy, complex middle ground that I think accords with most people's intuitions, right? Sometimes some wars are bad and unjust. Resisting those people is therefore ethically permissible, but then we have to specify it. The key, I think, is not to get too caught up on what we mean by just war, right? It's not a vacuum-packed uh, set of principles, right? It's an ongoing conversation that deals with things like new players, uh, uh, newly aggressive old players, new technology like cyber, right? Issues of character and will, right? Even the just war tradition itself is plural, right? Between more traditional forms, more revisionist forms that want to link the categories of ad and in and post bellum. And just war theory has been through a whole range of challenges before, but it has proved itself just as enduring and relevant and needed as a counterweight to the two more extreme traditions than ever. We just have to be patient and participate in the conversation. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'd like to start with a confession. Uh, last week was the last week in my Just War elective, so I naturally took the questions we were given and run, ran them by my students. So any brilliance is theirs alone. Anything you don't like or disagree with is my fault. Um, so I appreciate the comments here. I actually do want to build on Dr. Wren's uh, idea of the conversation. Because I think of just war theory as a mode of deliberation, a way of thinking about and having conversations about when war is just and how one might conduct war and what happens after war. And so um, there are two books, so yes, I'm giving you homework, um, that have informed my thinking. The first is Chris Coker's Warrior Geeks, which is really about a lot of these technological issues. 
and then Paul Shari's Army of None, which is really about AI, but more specifically about autonomy. And I think both of those books raise the question of uh, what I call uh, professional judgment and discretion. So yesterday you all talked about the profession of arms. I think one of the distinguishing features of any professional is the ability to engage in professional judgment and discretion. And so I think that is really the core of how to navigate all of the different domains going forward. So I would, I, I would argue that war has always been complicated and messy. Um, now we might think of it more in terms of predict unpredictability and complexity. And the question is, uh, you know, how do you navigate that? And I think how you navigate that is having people who have professional uh, judgment uh, and discretion. And that's a piece of what I call ethical leadership. And I wanna, as a philosopher, I must make a distinction because that's what we do. Uh, between moral leadership and ethical leadership. You all are here because you are moral leaders. You're personally, uh, one presumes, people of good moral character. Um, and I would say to this point, that has served you well. Um, but I have some bad news for you. Um, and that is, that's not enough. Going forward, you will need ethical leadership. And ethics is... Um, slightly different than morality in that it requires critical questioning, examination of assumptions, people willing to enter into dialogue with other people who have different moral commitments and different moral ideas. Martin, my, my colleague and, and predecessor at the Naval War College, laid out that issue quite well. So I think ethical leadership is going to be really important, but of course, um, how do we think about having those conversations? And I would argue that philosopher Alistair McIntyre's idea of communities of practice is really helpful. You all are members, as a member of a profession, of one such community of practice. Community of practice, communities of practice have norms, commitments, histories, traditions that, that bound them and define them. But I think something that's really important to lift up but to you is that you aren't just members of a profession. You are now about to cross over into those that hold the profession, that will keep its traditions and norms, but also those who will mold and change the profession as that is required. And in order to know, um, to paraphrase Kenny Rogers, uh, to know when to hold them and to know when to mold them. Thank you for laughing at that. I'm glad you all like. <laughs> because my undergraduates don't know who Kenny Rogers is. Um, that's, why, that's why I moved to graduate, because um, my references were you know, not hitting home. But as the holders and molders of your community of practice, you need professional judgment and discretion to know when to keep things and when they have to change, and that includes your engagement with uh, uh, just war thinking or just war traditions, plural. Um, because there isn't just one tradition, there isn't just one way of thinking about it, so you have to be able to navigate and ask questions and exercise your ethical capacities like empathy, like moral imagination, those kinds of things, to really be able to think and navigate in, uh, in a very complex environment. The other community of practice that's important, I represent the community, the community of practice, it's not academia, but it's um, our political community. I'm a citizen of the United States of America, and you all work for me, uh, and work for us collectively. We are a community of practice, and it is also our responsibility to think about and engage in this conversation. Um, in the Q&A, if you wanna talk about a civ mill matters, I have a few thoughts on that, but I would just sort of lift that up that you are a community of practice, but there's also a larger uh, a community of practice to which we all belong uh, as citizens, and that is an important part of just war thinking as well. I think it's something that is definitely a challenge in an environment where very few of my members in my community of practice overlap with yours.
And so there are questions about who bears moral responsibility. There are questions about moral exploitation, whether we are asking you to take on too much moral risk, those kinds of questions. So um, in the vein uh, of Martin, I think I've probably asked more questions than I've answered, but I'm a philosopher, so that's what we do. Thank you. Years ago, uh, General Dunlap of Air Force JAG created this term, lawfare, uh, and I think that's what you were referring to. And it would be, I think, helpful to explain to your students what lawfare is, and it, it directly touches on your sense of the limits of law act are much broader than the way we necessarily think we're being influenced by the international community. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, somehow you can constrain through non-state practice. Remember, law is created by state practice either by treaties or by custom of practice over time. So your law of armed conflict started as custom. What were the rules relating to whether you attacked the baggage trains or the non-combatants in the, in the village or the city? That was uh, later codified uh, in treaties. And you know them as the Geneva Conventions, the Hague Conventions, the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions and, and so forth. Uh, lawfare is the notion that there are other influencers that can create or at least purport to create state practice and binding precedent on us. Uh, and so uh, what General Dunlap was referring to, and I believe what uh, Dr. Cook would refer to is the, is the notion that, which I was trying to refer to, is that we have to know the law better than anyone else. And that means all of you, all of you that uh, are, are professionals in, in the armed forces, we have to know the law so that when somebody suggests that we have to use a precision weapon, if we have them, we can confidently say, no, no, that's not what is required. That when you do a proportionality assessment, it doesn't require 48 hours of intel in human gathering. It might be desirable. It might be within your window of opportunity to do that, but you may only have less than 60 seconds to do a proportionality analysis. And you have to know with confidence that that is what the law allows. And you also have to know Mosul is a great example. There's a great piece now out um, published. It's called, it's called What the Mosul Study Missed. Uh, and it's this notion that it's, uh, he refers to it. Uh, his name is Amos Fox. I believe he's an, uh, an officer. Um, this is basically it's called the precision paradox. You get, uh, you, you have uh, a precision round that's fired at a target and you get some effect, but you also get squirters. We refer to them as squirters, uh, the spider effect. They run from the building to a new building. You use another precision weapon on the next building. There's, you get a few measurable effects and then another squirter. And then another precision weapon, such that you've now leveled, instead of one building, you've leveled maybe four or five using precision weapons. We have dumb bombs for a reason. They're lawful. And so we have to understand that the law allows us to use the dumb bomb to avoid knocking down five buildings. We'll just knock down one. It also has the effect of a grinding process through a city. If, if, if the academics perhaps or, or, or non-governmental groups suggest that we must use or we must no longer use wide, uh, wide area explosives in urban environments. The ICRC does not legislate what the law of armed conflict is. They comment on it, but it is not the force of law. Lawfare is this notion that if the ICRC says with its moral authority you should not use wide area explosives in cities, we must comply with that. It's each one of you's obligation, along with mine as your Judge Advocate General, to know that that is not in fact true. We can use wide area weapons, wide area explosive weapons in cities. We may choose not to, but what we found in Mosul, for example, is we end up firing five or six precision weapons when one dumb bomb could have achieved the greater objective, one building vice, let's say, five. So I, I hope I answered your question, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a hugely important matter for and this isn't just the JAG's problem, right? There's a reason you've got the judge advocates in your study groups. They learn from you, you learn from them, you learn what they do, they learn what you do. But fundamentally, 
it is always the leader, the commander's requirement to know what the law allows you to do so that when you get the advice, you then ruminate on it and you make the decision what the right answer is. It's not the lawyer making the decision. You as the commander have to know the law. So I thank you for the question, but very important. Thank you. Thank you to our panel members. So at this point, yes, we will now stop recording, and this will be a non-attributional conversation. We have our